everyone, how's it going? Uh, if you're here, go ahead and set hey in the chat. Hey, John. Welcome, welcome. Um, all right. So, can start a couple minutes late here today, but. Should be a fun stream today. We're going to be talking about BRMS, uh, which is a um, package in R that I absolutely love. Uh, we're going to be talking about regression, uh, Bayesian regression specifically, hierarchical linear models. Uh, going to be super, super fun. So um, I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, I got to give a shout out to Richard McElreath's um, statistical rethinking book. I actually have it available right here on my desk. Um, it is the book, and uh, specifically the set of lectures he has on YouTube, um, is basically how I got started with um, Bayesian statistics. Super, super helpful. Um, and there is a BRMS version, uh, sort of a, a translation of the book that I'm going to post in the chat um, by uh, Solomon Kurz, who just does an incredible job of, of taking the code uh, that McElreath has created in his rethinking package uh, and translates it to BRMS, which um, I just find to be a, a little bit cleaner. Um, it's just my opinion. Um, it's a little bit more general. Um, so uh, I'm going to be showing off BRMS here. Uh, we are going to be using some uh, data from McElroy's book. Um, I've actually never played around with this data set. So uh, it should be fun. Let's see how it goes. Um, I'm actually, let's go ahead and work in, a, in our markdown so we can sort of create some plots and stuff interactively. Uh, BRMS tutorial. Actually, uh, I'll have to rewrite that. BRMS tutorial. Cool. Okay, I actually, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, know this, I do put all of this code um, up on GitHub. Uh, you can see I've got my uh, live stream code repo here. So um, if you want access to this code, it is up on my GitHub. Um, uh, the, none of this code is designed to sort of be useful on its own, but if there's something you want to do faster than uh, sort of writing it out yourself to just copy paste it. So just so you know, that is there. Uh, this tutorial will be up probably sometime tonight or tomorrow. Cool. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get BRMS in here. Go ahead and run this cell. Uh, package or namespace failed to load for tidyverse. Failed in broom. Okay. I guess something happened to my broom install. So I'll go ahead and run this quickly. Hey, Will, how's it going? All right. Hello. Hello. All right. Well, all I actually want is dplyr, so <laughs> that's fine. I'll look into that later. I was messing around with installing the rethinking package earlier, um, and then I was like, "How about I just download the CSV from GitHub?" Um, oh, oh, it's for BRMS. Package or namespace. Wow, what a good start today. Usually I can at least get through loading the packages in. Okay. Restart R real quick. Let's see if that does anything. Weird. All right, well, something weird just happened there. I bet this will actually work now. Please uh, excuse me while I debug my R install. <laughs> All right, there we go. 
Cool. So um, let's go ahead and load in this data and just take a look at it. I've seen it in the context of uh, McElroy's book, uh, but I have not actually played around with it myself. Uh, I was quite lazy. Um, in fact, I didn't really read the book. I mostly just went through his lectures. So I haven't really run any of his code. <laughs> just sort of have looked in the output. Um, so um, <clears throat> I want to spend some time here just to figure out what this um, what this code actually uh, has in it, what this data actually has in it. Um, this uh, data is apparently semicolon separated. <clears throat> so watch as I try to recall how to define something other than delim. There we go. I think set might be pandas delim. Does read CSV not take it? Do I need to do this? Okay, there we go. All right, so here's our data. Wow, bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a struggle getting started on this one today. Um, okay, so so what is going on in this data? I'm let me just pull up the book, and we can uh, figure out what's going on here. And will help me out. I know you know it. This is basically an experiment where chimpanzees have to pull um, have to pull a lever. Um, so you can see we have we have different actors. So this is going to be we're going to work up to doing um, uh, hierarchical linear models, and so actor is going to be something that we're going to basically use as um, like one of our clustering variables. Um, and then you can see there's this like pulled left uh, variable here um, that uh, indicates uh, which of the two levers they pulled, I believe. Which chapter am I looking at? That is an awesome question. Um, I feel like it's like 14 in the second edition. But uh, let's see. It might be 13. It's definitely after. Oh, might be 13. Yes. OK. Yeah, so chapter 13, if, if you have this book, there's also PDFs of statistical rethinking floating around, um, which are legitimate. Um, Richard McElroyth was nice enough to put um, nice enough to put draft chapters of the second edition up, um, which is really great. Uh, so it's not too hard to find a um, draft uh, version of this book, uh, which I highly recommend, and I highly recommend you all um, buy the hardcover version as well, because really uh, an excellent book. OK, so I will just read um, I will just read what it says um, about I will just read what it says about this data set. OK, so it's actually chapter 11, which is where this data set was first introduced. Uh, let's see here. Chapter 11. OK. The data for this example come from an experiment aimed at evaluating the pro-social tendencies of chimpanzees. The experimental structure mimics many common experiments conducted on human students uh, by economists and psychologists. A focal chimpanzee sits at one end of a long table with two levers, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, on the table are four dishes, which may contain desirable food items. The two dishes on the right side of the table are attached by a mechanism to the right-hand lever. The two dishes on the left side are similarly attached to the left-hand lever. Um, the lever that's pulled controls uh, the dishes that slide towards the opposite ends of the table. 
so basically what happens is uh, a chimpanzee is uh, able to deliver food uh, to another um, partner chimpanzee. So it's looking at social behavior. Um, I will show, there's this funny little drawing here. It's not super easy to see, but there you go. Cool. Yeah, uh, we are going to be doing a multi-level model, although I don't want to start there. I just want to show the basic BRMS syntax uh, for like a very simple uh, regression. Okay, so that's the data. Um, if you have uh, the rethinking package, uh, which you can just grab from GitHub, it's easy enough to find. Uh, you can also, chimpanzees, you can also pull up the help for it, uh, which contains uh, like a data dictionary here. So uh, actor is just going to be our actor number. We'll be sort of coming back to that. Uh, recipient will help us determine whether or not there is a partner. And that is also just a number it looks like. Cool. Um, okay, so condition also. Um, just shows whether there is or is not uh, a partner present. Uh, block and trial, probably not too relevant for us. Um, Pro-social left. So this is whether the pro-social option was on the left. Uh, and then this looks particularly relevant, whether the chimpanzee uh, chose the pro-social option. Um, and then uh, there's the actual lever that the chimpanzee pulled. Okay, so basically none of this matters. Um, what matters for us is this uh, chose pro-social uh, option or, or column uh, and the actor column uh, and this condition column. I think uh, that is a pretty good place to get started here. Okay, so um, thank you for bearing with me while I um, sort of got set up here. Uh, let's go ahead and just run a like base R uh, linear model. This is going to be basically equivalent to a t-test uh, where we're looking at uh, the difference between um, condition and uh, chose pro-social. And I'm going to do what I think a lot of people do in psychology, which is um, when you have data like this, multiple trials, uh, there is a desire to like be able to do a t-test or an ANOVA. Uh, so what you'll see is uh, the data gets summarized. So we would have chimps. Um, we would group by actor, and then we would summarize. Yeah, I mean, Will, you, you joke in the chat, but I know that you use K as a metric as well. So, um, and let's see, we want, let's say, uh, mean chose. Uh, pro social equals mean. Yeah, shows pro social. There we go. Okay, so let's run this. Um, oops, there we go. Okay, so what did I do? I just took an average of um, each chimpanzee uh, and how often they chose the pro-social option. Okay, and now, uh, of course, we also want to group this by the condition that they are in. Cool. Okay, so now, uh, hopefully it's a little bit more clear where we're getting started here. Um, we are just going to compare these conditions. These seven actors are, are our participants. Uh, and then we're just going to look for a difference here. So this is where we're starting. We're basically starting with the equivalent of a t-test. In fact, let's actually go ahead and do that. 
let's run a t test with uh, this as our data. And let's go ahead and say uh, we're doing this column and we want um, condition equals zero. So if you're not following, if you're used to like the dplyr syntax, you're not following what this is doing, it's just giving us uh, our seven uh, rows in our data where the condition is zero. And let's go ahead and do the same thing for condition one and run this t-test. So, okay, we can see, um, as you might expect, right with um, seven chimpanzees, uh, there is no uh, significant effective condition here. So uh, if this is sort of like your first approach is if you're faced with this data to just try to summarize and run a t-test, um, well, you, you would have gotten a no result and you'd kind of be done. And that is uh, all you would get to say is that you found a no result. So let's see if we can do any better. Um, the next thing I want to try is uh, mathematically pretty equivalent to this. Um, it's going to turn this t-test into uh, a linear regression with the built-in R function LM. Uh, to do this, we will uh, define the data that we're using, and then we will use the formula syntax in R. So let's um, go ahead and grab the column that we're trying to predict, and we are going to predict it uh, with our condition column here. Okay, so you can see we're not taking into account any information about the chimpanzees. The chimpanzees are basically, because we're doing frequent test statistics right now, uh, they're basically being treated as like random individuals, right? This is our random sample of seven chimpanzees. Uh, let's go ahead and save the output of this to a variable fit. And then we can just do summary fit, go ahead and run this whole thing. Cool, okay, so um, if you you know are used to t-tests and, and regression, you'll notice that uh, our t-value here uh, and our t-value here are identical, except for rounding. And you'll notice our p-value is identical, right? This is mathematically basically the same thing. Um, if you're not used to looking at regression output, you might sort of see this intercept and think, oh, wow, you know, we got a super significant result. Uh, unfortunately, this intercept uh, doesn't really mean anything. All that is saying is that um, the mean is above zero, right? Which um, is, is sort of clear enough looking at this, right? It's saying that on the whole, you know, these numbers are, are pretty high above zero. So um, Will, did I just do what you said to do in the chat? Basically, I'll go ahead and add a little bit to it, but we're fitting a function of y equals mx plus b, right? Uh, b is our intercept here. Uh, so our intercept is 0.55 which basically means um, the average here is around 0.55. And then this condition estimate says, uh, if our condition is equal to one, which means the partner is present, um, what effect does that have on this Y, right? So M here is 0.02 x is a 1 or a 0, which means this 0.02 is added to our 0.55 when um, the uh, x is 1, which occurs when partner is present. So um, about a 2% um, addition is, is what our model is estimating, uh, and it, it's not reliable. Right, so um, 
yeah, thanks, Will, in the chat. So the t-value is uh, the estimate divided by the standard error, which is which is telling us, um, yeah, do we think that this uh, parameter is actually reliably meaningful? And in this case, um, based on both our low t-value and our high p-value, uh, we don't think that condition is actually really doing anything here. Um, probably our model just predicting the mean would be pretty much as good. So, okay, we have uh, completed uh, a very sort of straightforward linear model with our data. Um, we haven't taken into account though, uh, the fact that in sort of psychological terms, what we're dealing with is um, a within the subjects experiment, right? Within subjects, meaning that uh, each actor is participating in uh, both conditions, right? So uh, in a psychological experiment um, and in, in many other places, this is the sort of thing you want to account for. A simple linear regression um, by default uh, is not sort of taking in this factor into account. Um, this matters because um, the variation that you sort of expect here is dependent on the fact that we're within subjects. Um, so the like traditional way of dealing with this is to do like uh, repeated measures ANOVA. Um, but the, I would say more modern, certainly the more general way of doing uh, this now is to do uh, a hierarchical linear model um, and to account for that structure. So that is uh, one thing that BRMS is going to do for us. It's going to give us access to hierarchical linear models. Um, there are other packages that do this. Uh, LME4 is one. Um, but uh, what's unique about BRMS is that it is um, going to give us a Bayesian hierarchical linear model. Um, so let's work up to that, right? Let's first add in, um, uh, let's first add in actor information, then we can make it hierarchical, and then we can finally add sort of this Bayesian layer on top of it, and, and we'll just sort of compare as we go what's changing, what's happening, what's different, um, all that good stuff. So what's sort of like the next uh, level um, past this like very basic linear regression. Well, we might try something uh, like this, right? If we want to account for actor information, um, we could just sort of add in a, I'm going to wrap this in factor. I, I don't know if it's actually needed. Um, but just uh, to save a little bit of time here in case it is, um, I'm using this factor just to make sure this is converted to a factor. Um, but basically what I've done is a sort of naive way of adding this actor information to the model. This might be sort of a, a first attempt here. And what this is going to do is treat uh, actor as a fixed effect is um, a term you'll hear a lot for, for these types of models. Um, what does that mean? Well, you can just see sort of what's happening here. Basically, each actor, uh, except for the first one, because um, uh, the first actor is, is sort of implicit, um, each uh, other actor besides the first is going to be given um, its own coefficient, right? So condition has a coefficient. Um, and now actor two and actor three and actor four and actor five and six and seven all have their own coefficients as well. Uh, we can see due to probably multiple comparison randomness, um, a couple of our actors actually show uh, barely significant and trending um, p-values here. So you might be tempted to do something like this and, and look and say, oh, so it worked but only for actor two uh, and actor six. Those were the only two actors that showed um, 
a, a meaningful effect here. Um, but this isn't really what we're trying to do, right? We don't want to know if actor two uh, through seven are like different from the other chimpanzees. That's basically what we're doing here. What we want to know is whether um, the effect of condition matters based on which chimpanzee is doing the task, right? So we failed to sort of do um, what we really want to know here, which is we're interested in the effect of condition. How does the effect of condition vary by which actor uh, we're looking at? So um, we've added in actor information, but we haven't done it in a very um, smart way because we're not really answering the question that we're uh, interested in. So let's convert this um, sort of traditional or, or fixed effect model into a mixed effect model or a hierarchical linear model, uh, a couple different names for it. Um, and to start, let's just go ahead and use um, this package uh, LME4, which does frequentist uh, hierarchical linear models. Um, so I'm just going to copy most of this. Let's say fit three. Okay, and then um, we're going to get rid of this. So let's actually just start here. Um, I th think the function name is N, NLME, though I get it mixed up with uh, other packages. So let's just look and see. LMER. There we go. LMER. Cool. So this is going to run uh, the exact same regression as before. We have not yet added uh, the actor information, right? We've taken this out. This is the same as our uh, our linear model here that we ran. We're just now using a different uh, package to do it. So um, cool. So LME4 actually doesn't let you do that. Uh, one thing that's nice about BRMS is BRMS totally does let you do this. If you want to run a normal Bayesian regression with BRMS, uh, you can totally do that. So we'll show that later. Um, okay, well, that's too bad that we didn't get to uh, take a look at that, but that's fine. Let's um, just go ahead and show uh, this syntax for uh, random effects or um, uh, grouping variables. Those are sort of the two terms for uh, what, in our case, is this actor information. Um, and in fact, I'm going to pull up. Um, a demo that I really, really like here and just post this in the chat. If you've never seen hierarchical linear models before, um, this will really help. Let's see. There we go. OK, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit abstractly, um, but I definitely recommend you go and sort of check out that um, link for like a interactive sort of intro to, to hierarchical models, super useful. Um, OK, so um, we basically have two things uh, that can vary in our hierarchical linear model. We have um, an intercept per chimpanzee in our experiment, and we also have a slope per chimpanzee. So um, let's go ahead and actually, let's create a plot here uh, that I think might help. So we have our data, and we have our, um, let's, I actually don't want the summarized version of the data. I want actor. Let's see. I want to facet by actor. Act. 
character. And then I want um, condition and chose pro social. So this isn't going to look great, but let's go ahead and try this. What does facet wrap do? You are about to see. Uh, it creates a subplot per, um, well, per whatever. For, for us, it's per actor. Okay, and let's actually, let's make this jitter. Okay, so we're working up, that's so handy? Yeah, seriously. Okay, that jitter is way too much. Okay, cool. So, um, this is like not a super useful plot, but it, it sort of gets the point across. You can imagine, right, there's like, um, because eventually we're working up to doing a logistic regression. Uh, you can imagine there's sort of like a sigmoid here. Anyway, uh, point is um, each of our actors might have a general rate of choosing a pro-social that varies from other actors, um, depending on our condition. So the first one that I said was a random intercept. It's the overall base likelihood of uh, choosing pro-social. And we can imagine that you know, might vary by actor. Um, the second one was a random slope. That is, um, how does a different effect vary by actor or by grouping variable more generally? Okay, so not a super useful plot, but that's okay. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do is a, a random intercept. So we're going to allow each chimpanzee, chimpanzee to have um, a unique rate of choosing prosocial behavior. The way we do this is uh, first, all random effects are um, going to appear in parentheses. Everything on the left side is sort of the um, well, uh, let's talk about the left side in a moment. On the right side, it's going to be our grouping variable. So that's going to be actor. On the left side is what we want to vary by actor. Right now, all we want to vary is um, a random intercept. Uh, and so we're just going to put a one here. That's the syntax. Uh, if you're still shaky about like what a random uh, intercept and a random uh, slope R. Check out that um, that demo, super useful. But uh, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, we are going to allow random intercepts by actor. And let's go ahead and print this out. So this may take a moment here. Cool, didn't take too long. Um, okay, so now uh, our output is gonna look a little bit different. And remember, this is all still frequentist. Right, uh, we're doing MLE. There's nothing sort of crazy Bayesian stuff happening here. Um, it is uh, just a, a mixed model is the only thing we've added in. We haven't added in any frequentist statistics uh, or any Bayesian statistics. We are working up to that. Um, so let's look at our output here. How is this different from um, really compared to this one, this LME output? You can see um, we have now random effects and fixed effects. Okay, so the random effects, you can see uh, we have our groups listed. That's our actor here. And what did we allow to vary by actor? We allowed uh, the intercept to vary. So we have uh, an intercept parameter for our actor group. And how is this summarized for us, right? So each of our seven actors is getting its own intercept. Uh, so we're not getting sort of all seven of those values out. Instead, what we're just getting is a summary here. Um, 
that shows the um, the standard deviation of those values. Right. In our fixed effects, in an experimental setting like this, um, this is usually what you want to look at, uh, or at least your final sort of conclusions are probably going to be based around this number. Um, so you can see the estimate is, is actually very similar to what we had before, around 0.02. Uh, but now you can sort of be confident that the actor level information is being uh, incorporated uh, correctly, right? Uh, we're taking into account the fact that each actor may have uh, its own um, rate of choosing prosocial behavior. Okay, so now let's add in um, uh, a random slope over condition. To do this, we just replace this one with condition. Now implicit in the LME4 syntax is the fact that we are still gonna get uh, random intercepts here. So sort of secretly under the hood, uh, this is going to happen unless you explicitly put a zero in. Although usually it's good practice to have um, random intercepts vary. There are some cases where you, you don't want it or, or don't need it, um, but oftentimes you do. Um, so the default is just to include random intercepts. Uh, and so we don't actually need to put the one plus there. We can leave it off and just indicate the variable that we want. Um, to have random slopes. And because condition is the only variable um, that um, we're including in our model, condition uh, is what we want to have random slopes. So uh, hopefully this will actually go ahead uh, and fit for us. In BRMS, this would fit in uh, LME4, it might fail to converge because we're dealing with this problem where the number of observations uh, is equal to the number of random effects, right? So if we look here, we're trying to get uh, a random intercept and a random slope of condition for each of our um, for each of our actors, uh, and so LME4 uh, can't handle this. Uh, BRMS can actually handle this model uh, through the power of Bayesian statistics and priors. Um, so this is, I think, as good a time as any to switch on over to BRMS. The reason I'm spending a bit of time showing LME4 here is because the syntax of BRMS is actually uh, basically the same for, for many sort of simple tasks. It's exactly the same. Um, and in places where it's not the same, it's at least logically consistent. So um, let's go ahead and define a BRMS model. Let's use this. Uh, sort of definition here. Uh, the function name is now BRM. There we go. Um, and okay, pretty straightforward. We now have um, a BRMS model instead of an LME4 model. However, uh, because we have now made the switch to Bayesian statistics, uh, there are more things to define. Oops. Nope. Thank you, R Studio, for your autocomplete, but right now I would prefer if you didn't. Thank you. Okay, so we can see we have all of these parameters here to fit. Uh, so let's go ahead and add some of them in. Um, luckily, uh, you actually don't need to define uh, very many of these. Oftentimes the defaults are totally fine. One thing I wanna do is just, uh, we can keep the chains at four, but let's make the iter 1000 to make it train a little bit faster. Um, okay, cool. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, the other thing that is good to define are priors, uh, but we are gonna start with that set to null. So it's gonna use the default priors. Um, this will take longer than uh, LME4. 
Why? Because what BRMS is doing is using this uh, package called STAN, which is not R specific. Um, and STAN is actually doing sort of all the work here. Uh, BRMS is basically translating this syntax and these arguments into STAN code. It's running STAN um, and it's going to spit back um, the models. So it's actually happening under the hood here as STAN is running um, an MCMC algorithm to get uh, samples from the posterior distribution um, so that we um, will see how this model fits. So we'll be talking more about all that. Um, the slow part um, is going to be a compilation for small models like this. So you can see uh, the time that it was actually fitting was fairly short. Uh, it was here where it was compiling, uh, but sort of took a long time. Um, with more uh, complicated models, uh, the fitting time will actually end up taking a lot longer. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this. Uh, we get some warnings, but um, because we're just sort of playing around here, nothing too, um, nothing too scary. So let's go ahead and actually print this out. And to avoid sort of running all that again, I'll go ahead and print that out in a new chunk. There we go. OK. So uh, what you'll see is that this syntax, uh, or, or rather this output, is very similar to LME4. Um, we get group level information. Okay, So before it was called random effects. Now it's called group level information, or uh, group level effects. Uh, and then we get population level effects. So this maps on to this concept of fix effects. Um, but uh, a lot of the information is the same, or at least uh, sort of what you should get out of it is the same. We have uh, some extra information here. Um, R hat is useful uh, for determining how well your model fit. You want this to be very close to 1. 1 1.01 .01 is, in fact, uh, a little bit high. Um, I would probably uh, add more iterations here and hope that that number would go down a little bit. Um, bulk ESS uh, and tail ESS uh, are sort of similar measures, um, which often will provide valuable information about how well your model is fit, um, and also sort of how much confidence you can have in the estimates. Um, but to save time, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this stuff today. Um, there's certainly um, excellent resources about it. Uh, one in particular that's worth mentioning is the Stan user guide and Stan GitHub wiki. Those are two places where if you're interested in sort of getting more into the nuts and bolts and understanding what's going on here, definitely check those resources out. Okay, but um, in the meantime, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at, at sort of what is actually um, being shown to us here. So um, we have um, our group level information at the top, uh, where we have um, information about um, the intercepts that were allowed to vary, information about the condition uh, slope, which was allowed to vary. Um, and then we have our population level effects, where we have, again, our intercept, which you remember was estimated as uh, 0.55 before. Uh, here it is 0.56. Um, and then we also have our condition effect, which you can see is again estimated as 0.02. So there you go. I mean, if you stopped right here, you would get basically the same conclusion um, that the first uh, linear model gave us. Right. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that accounting for um, effects of actor um, for interpreting both uh, rate of prosocial behavior and the effect of condition was not too valuable. Or rather, it didn't make a big difference to our model. That makes sense because uh, we've summarized everything here. 
right? So uh, there's not really a ton of flexibility for our model um, to be able to sort of tease apart these things, right? Um, so what we're going to do next is actually use the uh, sort of more raw data um, that uh, just has the individual lever pulls as rows. Um, and we will use a logistic regression uh, instead, which will um, potentially change things a little bit. Uh, but first, before we do that, uh, I want to uh, show what is actually happening here um, for our prior. So to do Bayesian statistics, you need to define a prior. Uh, BRMS will attempt to uh, define priors for you. Uh, but uh, it is almost always better to provide your own. So BRMS makes it uh, really easy to do this. Um, basically what you do is you take the parts of your BRM call that are sort of specific to your model and you stick them into this get prior function. So you can see I've just copy and paste, pasted our model definition uh, and our data. And if you go ahead and run this, you can see uh, BRMS is, is telling us what priors it's actually using um, for our model. So um, there's this uh, LK, LKJ prior uh, that's going to be used for the correlation parameters. This is a good choice. Um, Probably you, you won't need to change that very often. Uh, but these student T priors, for example, are um, pretty, pretty wide. Um, so maybe uh, we would want to change the student T prior uh, to be uh, a little bit more narrow, right? Maybe we would want to make this a, uh, a normal prior instead of, uh, instead of student T, right? Um, that's one option. Here, what I'm going to do is just show how to change um, one of these parameters here, just to show it. Um, but really, it's not too uh, important for um, important for what we're doing today. Just a, a good thing to show. So uh, I'm just going to check to make sure I get this syntax right. Prior, okay. So. Um, Basically, there's this prior function that you can pass into the prior argument. And uh, let's see if there's a good example here. Oh, sorry, set prior, I think is what we want. Yeah, that's going to be a little bit easier for us. So set prior. Uh, and then basically, where did that go? Basically, you pass in, uh, you can either pass in functions or, or string representations of the priors that you want. Um, so let's actually go ahead and pull up the docs for set prior here. Uh, basically, it takes in uh, the class and the coefficient that you're setting a prior for. So let's just update, uh, let's update this intercept prior. So it's our fixed uh, intercept effect. Uh, currently, the prior is a student T distribution um, with these three parameters, one of which is um, degrees of freedom. I think that's the three. One is a non-centrality or let's see. Uh, let's see, there is, um, a mu, a sigma, and a df. Okay, yeah, so, um, it's, it's a little bit weird if you haven't, like, 
um, taking a deep dive into the T distribution, it's a bit weird to see um, three parameters to have both a, a DF and a sigma. Um, but um, it's, it's pretty handy to have access to these three parameters. Uh, so anyway, let's, uh, let's not spend too much time talking about that. Uh, let's show how to actually uh, set our prior here. So we can just uh, copy paste this as a string should work for us. Uh, set prior also takes um, this class. So we just go to the output from get prior. The class is intercept. So that should work for us. All right, so let's see if this uh, wants to run. Hopefully it um, will handle this string representation for us. And actually, uh, I'm realizing now I didn't actually uh, change the numbers. So let's just go ahead and make this three. Let's make that a little bit uh, wider. So there we go. Go ahead and print the summary again once, um, once that has run. Just take a minute here. Uh, and then we'll see that we managed to sort of successfully change the prior information. Cool. So uh, what do we want to add next? We've shown sort of how to change prior information. We've shown how to actually um, add uh, this actor information. Uh, next, what we will want to do is um, convert this away from using this summarized data and towards doing uh, a logistic regression to, so, to show um, how easy that is to do with BRMS. Okay, so there we go. Um, you can see um, we went into sampling there, which is pretty quick. Um, uh, we don't have the output to compare to anymore because I uh, overrode it, but even with a fairly small data set like this, you wouldn't expect uh, a fairly small change in the prior to have any sort of like huge impact. You can see our estimates here are, are basically the same. I forget what the SD was for the um, for the intercept before. So, you know, this this probably had a small change. This is sort of where you would expect it, <clears throat> but um, probably not uh, probably not a huge effect with a, a fairly small change in the prior. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab this. We will head on down to a new chunk. Call this fit five. Go ahead and print out our summary of fit five. Okay, so now let's actually now let's actually uh, convert this into a logistic regression. Uh, you'll see there's this family uh, argument here, which has this um, default value of Gaussian. Um, so that's sort of your standard regression. Uh, we can get rid of this. We'll just go ahead and use the default priors. Um, and we'll instead use our chimps data set. Okay, so um, to uh, convert this into a logistic regression, basically we're changing this family argument from Gaussian to um, binomial. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Family equals binomial. Um, done. Binomial, by default, as you sort of saw in that pop up there, has a default link of logit, logit. So um, we don't have to do anything else. This is going to use uh, a logit link function for us automatically. Um, that said, uh, I believe, yeah, so if we actually go back into uh, the docs for binomial, 
uh, you can change the link function. So uh, uh, other options are, are sort of listed in here. Uh, for example, um, the probit um, link is another uh, possibility. Let's see. Gaussian family, yeah, okay. The binomial family accepts logit, probit, um, couchit, which, sure, um, I guess that's one option, uh, and more. Okay, so uh, we won't get into that. Uh, it's going to use the logit um, link by default. So um, that's all we have to do. We just tell it to use binomial. It's going to use logit by default. Let's go ahead and run this. And uh, of course, this is now a different name. I chose ProSoch. There we go. Okay, so there you go. Uh, we are now predicting this chose ProSoch, um, which is a one or a zero um, based on the condition based on the condition um, slope and intercept by actor. Yeah, so um, this will look pretty familiar if you're used to using the sort of standard DLM function. Uh, we could have shown, and, and in fact, let's go ahead and, and show it right after this finishes running. Um, you can do the same sort of operation uh, yep, equals chimps. Uh, just with the built-in GLM function, uh, it takes a similar sort of syntax. One thing I really like about BRMS is it's using uh, common models for these types of operations. Um, you don't have to learn a totally new syntax or, or anything. If you know LME4 syntax, or even if you have a question and there's someone online who solved that problem with LME4, uh, you can um, transfer that knowledge to BRMS. Super useful. So um, there we go. Uh, so we could actually do the same thing with GLM, do family binomial. Uh, and you can see we get um, our logistic regression here. And if we wrapped that whole thing in summary, we would get the summary output. Right, except now this is a logistic regression. Uh, but we don't want to do that, right? We talked about uh, hierarchical linear models and why it's important to include our actor information, which is why we're going to use BRMS. Um, and so let's see, looks like it ran. Uh, and now we just have to print out the summary output from our BRMS model. Okay, and you can see we get sort of similar um, information. So we have you know, our group level effects uh, and our population level effects. You'll notice the uh, estimates are totally different, right? Now we are doing um, logistic regression, right? So we're now talking about um, like log odds. We're in log odds space, right? Um, but you can still um, interpret this very or, or pretty simply at least um, by looking at the credible interval, right? This is not a confidence interval, we're doing Bayesian statistics, so we get a credible interval. Um, and we can see that we don't have a ton of confidence um, in this model for what value this condition parameter should take on, right? Uh, we think it you know, could be anywhere between negative 0.3 and 0.5, basically. Really huge range. We don't really know what, um, we don't really know what value this um, condition parameter should be. Um, a reason for that is probably that we um, are allowing random slopes after actor, which is a little bit uh, optimistic. It's adding a ton of parameters that we need to um, estimate, and we don't have really great information about that. 
so let's actually change this uh, to do just random intercepts. Um, it's a little bit more realistic for the amount of data that we have. So basically what's going to happen here in a moment uh, once this runs is uh, this SD condition line is going to disappear. Um, and uh, we will be left with um, the SD intercept uh, and the intercepting uh, condition. We will also, uh, I believe, no longer have this correlation line. We no longer need to um, include that. So that's one less thing we need to uh, have as a parameter in our model as well. Cool, so we'll just give this a second here. Let's go ahead and pull up the console. Cool, okay, so you can see I didn't have the console up, but um, we're getting this helpful message. Uh, there's actually a Bernoulli family, which is uh, sort of a special version of binomial, and it looks like our algorithm might be a little bit faster, uh, although mathematically it shouldn't make much different difference. Um, but it might be a, a bit faster if we use Bernoulli, so good to know. I think we'll just keep it as uh, keep it as binomial for now. But uh, Stan specifically, I believe that was a Stan message, has a ton of useful um, error messages and, and warnings and things like that. So definitely um, take the time to look for those. OK, so you can see, like I said, uh, our SD uh, condition went away. Our correlation line went away. Now we're just estimating an intercept per um, per actor. Uh, and then we have our still our, our population level effects, our sort of global intercept, um, and our condition effect. right? And this is now on a scale where uh, like one would be a pretty large number. Um, and we can look at our credible intervals here. So um, that is most of what I wanted to show. Um, most of what I wanted to show with BRMS, there's a ton more uh, that you can look at. Uh, and again, I highly recommend both uh, the statistical Statistical Rethinking book by Mikkel Reith and the um, and the uh, BRMS translation of it. Uh, you can see if you actually just plot this model output, you get um, sort of useful density plots showing the range of um, parameter values that are being predicted. You also get trace plots for uh, MCMC um, diagnostics. And there is also a, I think it's plot effects. Is that right? Let's see. Uh, there's another function in BRMS um, that you can use to just get the uh, effect plot, which is super handy. And if I can find it, I will show it to you. Let's see. I will Google it quickly to avoid taking up any more time. marginal effects. So I think if we run this, uh, I think it will output plots for us. Cool. So because we only have um, this single effective condition, right, uh, we're not getting like a ton of valuable information here. Um, and in fact, the fact that this is a um, the fact that this is a line plot is showing me that this condition has been interpreted as uh, an integer 
or rather uh, a continuous value when we would prefer it uh, to be considered as a factor. So I'll go ahead and uh, update that quickly. Uh, but basically this marginal effects um, function just sort of shows you um, the output of your model with um, confidence information. So uh, in a second, it'll be more clear. Um, it'll be more clear uh, how this plot will be useful because instead of trying to show a line between zero and one, it will show just a um, two points with um, credible intervals. Uh, but it will take a moment for that model to rerun. Uh, but anyway, like I was saying, that is sort of most of what I wanted to show with BRMS. Uh, makes it really, really straightforward to run um, hierarchical linear models. If you've ever had trouble uh, with models converging in, for example, LME4, BRMS has a much easier time um, because uh, conditional effects now. OK, good to know. Uh, BRMS has a much easier time because in um, cases where you have a low number of rows compared to the number of parameters that you're trying to estimate, BRMS can sort of rely on the um, prior information that you're including in your model when you set the priors. Uh, so here, where we sort of had um, trouble fitting our model, uh, BRMS was able to handle it. Um, so that's also super handy. Not that that model would be sort of particularly informative, uh, but at least it doesn't break. Um, OK, so um, you can see I'm getting like a error here about um, the fact that I uh, was lazy and just used factor in, <laughs> in the model definition. So I guess to fix that, I would actually have to go in, um, fix the data myself to actually make this a factor. But instead of doing that, I think I'm going to uh, end today's live stream. So uh, if you enjoyed this video, um, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I appreciate it. Um, if you think it would help someone else, share with your friends, leave a like, leave a comment. Happy to answer questions um, sort of after the fact. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you'll, uh, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel and, and maybe pop in uh, next Wednesday uh, at 5 p.m. I don't know what we'll be talking about yet, um, but regardless, should be fun. If you have suggestions, uh, let me know. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.